The solar eclipse is next Monday, and Mercury is now retrograde, and the bundle is getting tighter all week. What does it all mean? Well, let's look at the charts together. I have a 39-minute video at the top of fenastrology.com that explains all of it, including a look at the biblical prophecy of the red heifer. Go to funastrology.com. Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Thomas Miller along with Robert Glasscock. And I got to tell you, this one could be a spoiler alert. This could get emotional. Hey, Thomas and Robert. You guys are really awesome. Um, I found you guys in the lowest part of my life. I was just wondering, is there any way that you can find out specific qualities or like anything about your parents through your natal chart? Um, I've been looking for my dad my whole life. Um, and, you know, just wondering. If you're not touched right now, and I told Robert about this, and some of you know from my other podcast, we haven't talked about it on here, but I'm actually personally going through a family situation where my family and I are not in contact. And I just thought how ironic this is, Robert, that here is a young lady who for all of her life wanted to know the man who helped bring her into this existence, to this incarnation, and can't find him. And my family knows me, and yet right now are not talking. So I know astrology can't point to where he may be, but certainly we know that through the 10th house and the 4th house and other places, other planets, and areas that we can find things out about our parents. So what would you offer to this young lady? Well, it's heartbreaking because you can hear in her voice, and, and one can well imagine, if you don't know anything about your father and have never known him, you would like to, and certainly you can go through Ancestry.com and see what you can find there. And there are a number of resources and so on. But if she spent a lifetime looking for her dad, seriously, and not been able to track him down, astrology can, in some circumstances, be very effective. Not in this case. Um, you have to, she apparently has already exhausted all of the, the resources that are available to track someone down. Um, astrology can really not offer much here because it can say, well, he's at sea or he's in the northern part of the United, those kinds of things. It's not helpful. But everybody has a father and a mother and everybody has a family. And the 10th, 4th axis in a, in a natal chart is what describes that axis. And in her case, I don't know her horoscope, but I guarantee you that if you look at her 10th, 4th axis, particularly her 4th house, and the sign that rules that house, and the planet that rules that sign, and that planet's aspects, any astrologer worth their salt would be able to say there is some mystery surrounding your father. Was he absent, either emotionally or physically? And then you can begin to get into what does that mean? And then she would instantly say, I've never known him. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. I've never been able to find him. Then you have something to work with because a person who does not know her father at all it creates a certain kind of psychological and emotional matrix through which they live. And when you think about the birth horoscope for every human being, the individual themselves is shown at the first house, at the ascendant. Their mate or partner, if they have one, is shown at the seventh house. Their parents are shown in the tenth, fourth axis, and graphically, we are meant to be in conflict with our parents and families for developmental reasons. That does not mean that it has to be overt conflict. And it certainly can, it doesn't prevent you from having wonderful positive relationships with both parents. But even the Bible suggests that when you become a man and a woman, you leave your parents and cleave to your mate. 
So there's that developmental experience that has to happen for everybody. And the, the developmental conflict, if you will, can be more dramatic and intense and even tragic in some situations, and it can happen at different ages. What you're going through right now with your family is later in life, and it is, frankly, I think, even more traumatic than if you have a break with a family that occurs earlier in life. Because earlier in life, you're probably going to break from your family to some extent when you go out into the world to make your own way. I did, too. So when you see a chart that says father or mother has been distant, or maybe there's been abandonment, and it's pretty clear. So you're looking at the 10th for the mother, if she's been raising yep. the, the kids, and the 4th for the father. What might you see in that configuration that would tip you off to abandonment or distance? Because I know a lot of our listeners have this. Well, the fourth house rules the father. The tenth house rules the mother. There's always been an argument, and I'm sure there always will be, but if you want to settle the argument, go read Mark Edmund Jones, and he will settle it for you, explaining the difference in terms of the mother's effect and influence on any child and the father's. The father is the parent of final recourse. Uh, it gets interesting today when you have same-sex couples, because which one is the mother, which one is the father? But in every couple, there is a parent of final recourse. And that's the classic cliche for this, is the mother telling the children, I'll tell your father when he gets home, he's the parent of final recourse. So the mother is the day-to-day -day ongoing authority. She's there when the kids leave. I mean, this is the old cliche household, but she's there when the kids go off to school. She's there when they come home from school. She supervises the kids all day. But the dad, theoretically, is off working and making money to support the family. When he gets home, he's the parent of final recourse. That's the fourth house. So the father is the fourth house. And to look at the father, your roots, in other words, your foundation at the fourth cusp, Typically, when you have a stepfather or a missing father or a father who's a drunk and absent emotionally or a father who's a workaholic and not there emotionally, all those things, you're going to see Neptune and Pisces, first of all, to give you the mystery and the missing quality and the question mark. That means your roots are in question psychologically. They're there from, from birth with Neptune down there is a question about your roots and about your security which is, is provided by the fourth house parent. So Neptune and Pisces, and then second of all, because Jupiter is the old Chaldean ruler of Pisces, Jupiter is also prominent in these sorts of situations. And you look to see the aspects that Jupiter and Neptune particularly are making in the horoscope to begin to get some insights into this influence or lack of influence from the fourth house parent, the father. And, you know, I'd like to flip it around because I know a lot of people might be thinking about this a different way. What in the chart would show if we as parents might be prone to having separation from our children? Kind of like my situation. And we'll stick my chart in the show notes for reference. Well, in, in your situation, for example, the children of anybody, male or female, or ruled by the fifth house, children in toto. So you want to see afflictions involving the fifth house and the planets in that house and the planets that rule that house. And when you have something like you do, which is Scorpio, Scorpio always carries with it the death and rebirth motif. People often focus only on the death part, and it's usually not a literal death. It can be, but it's often a figurative death. They focus on that part. What's the sense of loss? At the same time, simultaneously, you've got Scorpio and Pluto ruling death and rebirth. People forget the rebirth part so that in your chart, for example, you've got a whole stelium of, of Scorpio planets in the fifth house of children, including Mars and Neptune and your sun. And Mars and Neptune together with the sun tends to indicate 
the potential for there to be some religious element here because Neptune rules religions and spirituality. Scorpio, yes, it rules sex. Yes, it rules death and rebirth. It also rules the deepest kind of spirituality, and it is also a, one of the rulers of religion. Scorpio people often will go into a religious profession, for example. So I, I don't mean this in a bad way. But you can see that for starters. And then you have Uranus in Leo, the sign of children, squaring those Scorpio planets. And there's the separation. And there's the break, the potential for it. You know, the other thing that's common to this conversation is, from my perspective and from our callers, is how emotional this topic is. It really is something you never I mean, look, she's been looking all of her life. We don't know what that age is, but it is something you feel. A parent who buries a child never gets over it. And you don't. You can move on from it, but you don't get over it in that sense. And the second thing, Thomas, is, is fascinating to me with what has occurred with your family situation. We have the upcoming transit of Jupiter conjunct Uranus. Basically, and they're in Taurus, basically exactly square your Uranus at birth and opposite your vertex, if you want to go that far, get Scorpio. And this conjunction is felt at least a month, if not a little longer, before it happens, because Jupiter and Uranus are both fairly slow-moving planets compared to Mercury and Mars and so on. So it will be felt as well for months afterwards. But it's in fixed signs. Fixed signs don't get over things quickly. And in fixed signs, breakups, which happen to be very consistent with this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, breakups, divorces, earthquakes, literally earthquakes around the globe, which we experience, but earthquakes of a figurative kind, such as you've experienced. In a fixed sign, it is a buildup, a long buildup of pressures that are suddenly released. So the situation with your family has been building up for decades, and it was suddenly released. I only say that because I, you've shared with me a little bit about how far back this goes. And it's tragic because you do love them, and in fixed signs, the love never dies. It never dies. You can outgrow it, and you will outgrow it. So when these things happen in fixed signs like that, uh, they don't go away. But they do change you. And on a positive level, these same aspects, irony of ironies, correspond with births. Births of literal children and births of creative children. This coming Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is exactly that. So here again, we're all, it's in Taurus opposite Scorpio. We're all wrapped up in the death and rebirth symbolism. And this is the deepest mystery, I guess, of life. Death and rebirth. We all die physically at some point, but the soul never dies. Never does. But the form it takes certainly does. And these are death and rebirth situations in which the form of relationships dies, sometimes explosively, and it's like throwing the deck of cards up in the air and letting them fall and seeing where they fall, because they do fall on a new configuration. But in another way, a deeper way, it frees, even under this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, people who go through separations or divorces or deaths or explosions in the family and so on. At the end of the day, they are freer than they were before, to follow their own path, follow their own star, unencumbered and unrestricted by the former limitations that this so-called love, which is real, imposed on them. So these kinds of symbolisms will reach very deep when you're talking about these fixed signs, especially Scorpio, which is what this is all about. I don't know if that makes any sense to you about the children and that relationship, because it's hard. It really is. Yeah, man. And I appreciate you walking us through this. And folks don't know, but Robert has been like a rock 
for me through this in so many ways, from taking a look at the chart to just talking about transactional analysis, which is so important to him, to understanding the whole situation, to just being there, just sometimes just listening. So I appreciate you for that. I would like to ask one other little technical question here. You mentioned at the very beginning, you were saying, well, he might be out to sea or he might be up in you know this part ge geographical area. Where are you going in the chart for that kind of information? Let's say that he was out to sea or at least start looking around water. I mean, I you know, you kind of think water signs and Neptune and that kind of thing. But where do you look for those geographical kind of embellishments that might at least point an arrow in some kind of direction? Uh, there's no short answer to that. This is straight horary astrology. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, it, our, it, it, <laughs> where, right up where, our alley. <laughs> where, where, where is this? Where is this missing person? That's basically ah, you're the going question. To, okay. And now we're going back to William Lilly's rules, which are about 400 years old, but they still remain the same. Uh, in following the, you set up the horary chart for the time you understand the question and so on, and then you begin to read it based on very old techniques about as far as geography and uh, the whereabouts and so on. And also the likelihood of, of the parent or the missing person ever being discovered or found, because you can read that too. And in her case, it's very unlikely. It sounds to me that she certainly, you can hear it in her heart. She really, really would like to know. So I have to assume that she has explored all of the options that we have today. We're better off than we've ever been in history as far as Ancestry.com and the Internet and so on to find a, a missing parent. So I'm assuming that she's exhausted those things. Um, but unfortunately, astrology is not a miracle worker. It can't, um, it, 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 it can't really be satisfactory in a situation like this, which is frustrating. People want it to be. And people will try and make it so, even if it can't do it, they'll find a way to think it can. And and you see psychics, I'm not going to mention any names, Sylvia Brown, who predict on uh, Montel Williams' show with the parents in the audience, the parents in the audience of a missing boy, Sylvia Brown proclaimed psychically that he was dead and would be found under a rock. And of course, they were devastated. The boy turned out to be alive, and they found him up a year or two later. So I have nothing but revulsion at people who do that, who use metaphysics or astrology in that way. So this is a very difficult situation for her, but unfortunately astrology can't help there, but it can help talk to her about how a missing father has affected her life, because that's profound. Most of us know who our fathers are, but when you don't, it's very Piscean because it's not necessarily on the surface of your life. But if you don't know who your parent was, it has a subliminal effect throughout your entire life. I once had a client, Thomas, who was born in Vietnam. She was a Vietnamese girl, and she'd been thrown into the woods because she had some sort of birth defect. And in those days, that was a sign of the devil. And in Vietnam, they threw those children in the woods to die. In fact, I have one of these in my own family by marriage. But this woman not only did not know her time of birth, she didn't know her day of birth. She's the only client I have ever had who I, I told her, you don't have a horoscope. You never will. You'll never know your horoscope. And look at it this way. How amazing. To be utterly free of astrological whatever, limitations or insights, all you can do is use orary astrology in your life. But you'll never know. Well, that itself is a profoundly different way to live. And the same for this, this woman here who's been looking for her father. She will probably never know. And how does she live with that? Because it, it obviously makes her sad still. And that, you have to, in the final analysis, come down to that, too, as a choice. You can either feel like it's a tragedy and you can be sorrowful for the rest of your life, or you can accept the fact that you will never know, and it's sad, but it's not the end of the world. Go on. Define your own life. Do the best you can. 
search around. Maybe you'll find something about your ancestors. Maybe you won't. But to live a life constantly sad is a choice that we make as well. What an amazing topic, and one that does carry a lot of emotion with it. And to our friend, we may not know your name or your face or your chart, but a lot of people are sending you energetic love right now, including me. So thank you for that message. And you know, if hearing what Robert has said piques your interest to get a reading from him, his contact information is in the show notes, real easy to do, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about this. And the other thing is our horary course does have a whole module about finding lost items. So if you wanted to master and learn horary astrology, things like this come up, or you're consulting with somebody and things like this come up, that course is available as well. So that's at funastrology.com. And there's a link also to that in the show notes. Robert, thank you for this. Thank you for being there for me during this time. And thank you for listening. We appreciate it. And to our caller, we hope this helps. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Thanks for listening.